This podcast episode was made possible in part with support from Sacred Rights, a project funded by the Henry Luce Foundation and the E. Rhodes and Leona B. Carpenter Foundation and hosted by Northeastern University. Sacred Rights is a project that supports public scholarship on religion and provides resources and networks for scholars of religion committed to translating the significance of their research to a broader audience. I recommend you learn more about Sacred Rights on their website at sacred-rights.org or find Sacred Rights on Twitter at sacred underscore rights. Welcome to Classical Ideas. This is Greg Soden, and this is a podcast where, since 2017, I discuss all things religion with a variety of fantastic scholars, experts, authors, and educators. On this episode, my guest is Dr. Eugenia Rainey. Eugenia Rainey is an anthropologist who specializes in the intersection of leukemia religion and biomedicine. Her interests are centered in African diaspora religions, lived religion, race, medical anthropology, and healing. Dr. Rainey is working on a book project about religion as negotiated practice, examining the relationship between biomedicine and leukemia in South Florida. Currently a Mellon postdoctoral fellow at Dartmouth College, she holds a PhD in anthropology from Tulane University. This conversation focuses on leukemia, the path through anthropology, and the importance of public scholarship. Please enjoy my conversation with Dr. Eugenia Rainey. Dr. Eugenia Rainey, welcome to Classical Ideas. Thank you for having me. It's a delight that you're here. I am wondering if you can just spend a moment and introduce yourself a little bit to the audience out there so they know a little bit about who you are and what you do. Yep. Uh, well, my name is Eugenia Rainey, and um, I am a uh, I have a doctorate in cultural anthropology from Tulane University, and I study African diaspora religions and biomedicine. So, um, what's what's going on at the intersection of those two things? Yeah, you know, you're on a podcast right now. I usually talk about religion, and we're going to talk about religion, of course. But whenever I was looking at your bio, I was so fascinated that all of your professional training is in anthropology. And I'm wondering if you can just tell me a little bit about how you got interested in anthropology uh, going into your undergraduate years uh, in Chicago. Honestly, anthropology was always at the top of my list. And, and I'm not really sure why. I guess... Um, that would take a little more self-reflection on my part, but it was always it was always at the top of my list uh, when I entered college, and um, and yeah, by the time it was time to declare a major, I was pretty much set on the idea. But I started out studying South Asia uh, and looking at Hinduism and the intersection of the intersection of Hinduism and healthcare in India and. Um, after college, I, I ended up switching to um, Afro, Afro, um, African diaspora religions, but that space of religion and healthcare, I, I never left. Wonderful. So you kind of came in with a, an in, it was the interest in religion and healthcare kind of equal in the beginning. And that's kind of, you had a focus going in like that early. Gosh, um, I don't remember. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> it, it's been a long time, but it's it's always it's been there as long as I've been in anthropology. So, yeah. Wonderful. Well, one of my friends is a doctor and his undergraduate degree that he did before he went to med school was in anthropology as well. So, like, I know a person who was interested in anthropology from a young age, but then also became a doctor and got interested in medicine. So, like, I don't see these things as like, you know, I see this as a very natural progression for you, which I think is really interesting to see. Yeah. And I think perhaps probably one of those major influences would have been Foucault's Birth of the Clinic, mm. um, which I read. I don't know if I read that before I declared my major or not, but ultimately um, it's a it's a look at power and there's a lot of power in biomedicine um, and Foucault really 
digs into that in ways that I certainly found very compelling as an undergraduate and, and still do. Um, so it, it, it might have been Foucault as I think about it. Did you <laughs> ever the, the clinic that did it? Did you ever have med school ambitions? Were you going into anthropology and studying medicine like with the thought of becoming a doctor someday or was there was that ever part of it? I wouldn't say no. Uh, I wouldn't say that. <clears throat> I certainly um, went in thinking that maybe I would want more science training mm. um, as far as that goes. When I was an undergrad, they worked really hard to weed out people in the pre-med track. They were not, they were not generous or kind. Uh, and I was not that dedicated or that good at it, to be honest, to take the firing squad that they that they put before you. So nice. Yeah, University <laughs> of Chicago, there are no slouches. Mm -mm. Uh, I want to know a little bit about your backstory. You know, because uh, your backstory, I was reading some of your autoethnographic work, and it plays heavily into what you do today as a uh, professor and researcher in anthropology and religions. And the, the chapter that I'm referring to, of course, is a chapter called On Seeking Guidance, which appears in a book called Spirited Diasporas, Personal Narratives and Global Futures of Afro-Atlantic Religions. And I'm just curious about your backstory, uh, your family history. I just have so many questions related to this piece. And I'm wondering if you can just tell me a little bit about your backstory and then I'll kind of follow up from there. I, I, I study African diaspora religions because I'm, I'm a member of that community. I'm a devotee of Lukumi for a very long time now, uh, certainly my entire adult life. And um, I, I came to that through my older brother. So as somebody who's uh, spent a lot of time raising kids as well. The sibling bond is is um, very important in my life story, and I, I hope in my children's life story as well. But um, no, my brother was sort of always out there exploring different alternative religions far more fearlessly than I ever would. I did not. I remember being in high school and hearing students in the hallway in between classes talking about Ouija boards and satanic churches and, and all this stuff. And uh, my reaction was always, that's real. And I don't think you know what you're doing. So I don't want anything to do with you. I don't, I don't want to get into anything I can't handle. So when my brother read Margot Adler's Drawing Down the Moon, he found this um, a few pages in there about the Sabian religious order in Chicago, and he decided since he was living in Chicago uh, and he found them interesting, he was going to go knock on the door. And that's what he did. He just went and knocked on the door. And then um, when I came to visit Chicago to look at schools for college, he brought the whole family there. And so that was my entrance point um, into Lukumi. And for me, it worked. And my brother and I have sort of had this, uh, we've had this alignment in our uh, life journeys. Um, so we've, we've been together in this religion for 30 years. At Amazing. Least. More than that, I think, yeah. That's cool. Well, also, your family has roots in Cape Verde near Senegal. Uh, how does that place um, kind of resonate throughout your work as well? Because to me, it comes through so much. Um, well, of course, African, the African diaspora religions that I am have expertise in are all to do with the American uh, African diaspora. And when I say American, I'm referring to the Americas, not just the United States, but throughout um, the Western Hemisphere. So the Cape Verde is kind of, as I say in, in my chapter there, it's like the foothills before you get to Latin America. So a lot of the complexities around racial identi identities that you see expressed in the Americas sort of 
are nascent in the Cape Verde since it it gets um, colonized by the Portuguese before Columbus sails across the Atlantic and this I guess the, the last the last European to discover America as it were. So a lot of the complexities in, in racial identities and, and how to um, how to handle and think about race are there, but in a different way. So it sort of forces you to think about it a lot. And of course, in the United States, you always have to think about race. If you're not if you're not white, you always have to think about race. And it's good that you know we're everybody's thinking about it these days. Unfortunately. Some people are thinking about it in, in violent and, and very frightening ways. But the fact that it is at the fore of conversation is a good thing mm. on the whole with a few yeah. exceptions. Well, and I noticed that our life stories overlap just a teeny tiny little bit in my home state of Missouri. And you were living in Missouri, I think from the work, it, it seemed like you were there like all throughout the 80s. Um, and I was living in Missouri in the 80s as well, just down the road in St. Louis. But everything you just said about thinking about race as uh, somebody who isn't white is uh, has always been part of the thought process. And for a lot of people, it's a brand new part of the thought process. And I'm wondering if you can tie Missouri in just a little bit here and, you know, say what those years of living in, in my home state kind of did for you as a, a thinker in the world. Yeah. For me, and you know, um, my mom's cave and my dad is, is white and we were living and in the eighties in central Missouri, there was really no place for somebody like me. Uh, it, it, there was no conceptually there. People didn't have a, a nowhere to put me. And it was very, very racist. And my brothers who were older than me had to deal with it a lot more. It was a lot more at the fore for them. It was a lot more in your face for my brothers and for my mother. So that was dinner. That was dinner conversation for me as a young kid. And for, for me, it was less in my own life because uh, I perhaps because I was so young. It's it's a complicated question, but certainly uh, somewhat in my life and certainly in dinner table conversation, the experiences of my family, it was always at the fore, um, the conflicts, the racial conflicts that they were constantly forced to deal with. Let's go back to religion really quick. I have never talked about leukemia on this podcast ever. And I think that I would be doing a massive disservice to uh, the spirit of the show if we didn't chat about some of the practices and, um, you know, beliefs of leukemia in general. What is some information about leukemia that you think that everybody listening out there should know? It's part of the African diaspora caused by the transatlantic slave trade. It's rooted in Yoruba religion. And the Yoruba span Nigeria, Togo, and Benin in West Africa. So it comes to Cuba, to um, Trinidad, to Brazil, um, uh, and also throughout. Um, there are many African diaspora religions. It's not only the Yoruba. There's the Congo and, and the Home and, and many other places as well. But uh, as Lukumi goes, it's primarily rooted in the worship of the Orisha, of Egun, which are your ancestors. And so that's that's where the body of ritual comes from. And I think as somebody who tries to talk and who, who teaches about religion and, and is dedicated to the study of religion, one of the things that I think is important for that that is important to state explicitly because uh, I think it it muddies the communication if we don't uh, explain it. But Lukumi religion, like like many other African diaspora religions, is what we call it. It's a practice based religion. Mm -hmm. uh, and so oftentimes when people are referring to religion and they talk about religion, uh, they're referring to belief based religions and uh, Abrahamic religion specifically. And so when they don't see the characteristics of Abrahamic religions in uh, another religion, they, they say, oh, that's, that's not religion at all, that's something else, and, um, and so on and so forth. So I think it's important to sort of 
make that distinction. Mm -hmm. uh, Abrahamic religions and their characteristics are generally the characteristics of Abrahamic religions that come to mind are ex exclusive membership, hierarchical institutions, uh, professing belief, mm -hmm. and regular attendance in religious um, fun and in religious functions. You know, going to church and uh, going to mosque, praying four times a day, what have you is focus on eschatology, like what happens when you die, what happens when right. you die. Everything in your life is preparing for when you die. Uh, but in Lukumi, it's far more focused on the here and now and getting through this life and your relationship with all these Orisha and how you, how you can be close to them and close to your ancestors and cultivate those relationships and it's not really about what happens when you die. It's a really more focused on how you live. Right. Um, I am curious about some of those practices, too. You write a little bit in the piece about uh, going to seances with your brother mm -hmm. and things like that. I'm wondering if you can just like kind of describe what that looks like and what a practice may look like. Just any pick anyone that you can that you enjoy thinking about. OK, and I'm glad you asked that question, actually because that's an element of African diaspora religions that's specific to the Americas, because that is a European uh, tradition, actually. Mm. Spiritism is very popular throughout Latin America, and that's uh, credited to Alan Kardak, uh, who was a mid-19th century French gentleman who went to Brazil, and he cultivated um, the Misa in, in Cuba, you refer to it as a Misa. When I was uh, coming up in Chicago, we always refer to it as seances. So it depends on who you're talking to. But essentially, the white tablecloth Misa is um, the you, white <laughs> tablecloth on a, a table, glasses of water dedicated to different spirits, candles, and people meditate and communicate with spirits in the effort to make sure that they're in sync with with where they should be going to cultivate that relationship it's not at all like the sort of popular notion that people are communicating with their dead father because they miss him or something like that that's not at all the case because um it's probably a bad idea to communicate with your dead father, especially if he just died or your dead mother or your child or whatever. You know, the understanding is that the transition from life um, from being incarnate in a body to being disincarnate and just in the spirit world, it's a difficult transition. And if you keep trying to pull spirits back for your own, you know, satisfaction or to, you know, get over your, your loneliness or the void that's left because they're not in your life anymore it's it's not healthy mm. that's that's not a, a that's not a good use of a seance or a misa the the objective the understanding and, and this is from alan kardak this is not an african diaspora um, expression although those get practice is quite fluid so most of the people that i know uh in the lukumi community myself included these um, are practices that, that everybody does because there isn't the idea of exclusivity that, you, you know, you have to do one thing. And if you do other things, you're somehow being um, untrue to the one thing. It's more how, how, what are the different ways that you can cultivate and nurture a relationship with spirits that are, that are not incarnated, right? Mm. So that said, the understanding certainly in spiritism is that everybody has this cord, the spirit cord, this this group of spirits that help you along in life, and you sort of go through incarnations together. So sometimes you're incarnate, sometimes you're disincarnate, and they are same with them. And so you want to make sure that you're cultivating that relationship and that you're in tune so that you can get through this world as best you can. So that's that's the objective. But in Lukumi, there's a saying that in Lukumi and in, in Lukumi ritual, everything has to be 
everything with your spirits has to be satisfied before you can proceed with any ritual with the Orisha, like period. So if there's anything amiss between you and your spirits, your blood spirits, your religious uh, family, your blood family, if anything is, is not well in that relationship, it has to be satisfied before you can do anything with the Orisha. So the, the dead always come before the Orisha. Interesting. You know, something that's really fascinating about your work is that your work and your spiritual practices are kind of like aligned. And I'm wondering how you think about the fact that your like personal spiritual practices align with your academic path in a lot of ways as well. Like, what's that like for you, like combining the two? Historically, in the academy, that was a big no no. Uh, And and this gets us into a discussion of white supremacy in the academy and the, the notion that, you know, only certain people can be objective, um, mostly white men, white middle class men are the only ones who can be objective. So they have to study everything. And if you are a part of a community, you're not objective about it. But thankfully, that's something that is no longer the mainstream notion of how to go about anthropology, how to go about religious studies, thankfully, because from my perspective, one of, one of the things that you do in anthropology is you do field work in order to understand better, as best you can, the insider's perspective. That's the goal of field work. And I don't uh, want to get too deep into the weeds of the history of, of anthropology and modernity and, and all that um, modernism, postmodernism, all those things. But the whole point of cultural anthropology and doing field work, which is required of it, is so that you can understand the insider's perspective. So the idea that as an insider to be trained as an anthropologist, you're, uh, by my line of thinking, that make, puts me in a very good position to be a very effective anthropologist. There's also, it's important to be cognizant of the fact that historically there's, um, there can be a lot of suspicion in marginalized communities of people uh, who do anthropology because the idea that they're that they're more mercenary than anything, it's something to overcome. Uh, and unfortunately, it's you have to overcome it because people have done it that way uh, in the past. And so building trust is, is a challenge. Uh, but in my own, I, I think I need to return to my own story to your original question, in my own life journey, uh, after trying to avoid incorporating those two things, because in the community that I I originally came up in, there was a lot of suspicion of academics. I came to the conclusion that really this is the thing that I am most expert in. And I'm not going to be more expert in anything else. So, I mean, I can, I can try, but I have uh, important expertise in this that is important to get out there. I love that. That's almost that's like the spirit of public scholarship as well, putting things out there that you're an expert in in uh, in clear and communicative ways. I love that. Well, let's talk about some of your other work too. Uh, another piece that you sent me that I'm really enjoying is called "From the Margins In: What an Afro-Cuban Neo-Pagan Religious Group Can Tell Us About Spiritual Seeking in the United States." Tell me a little bit about the premise of this piece before we dive into it more specifically. Yeah, uh, well, it was, I came up in this, that the neo-pagan Afro-Cuban group, uh, that's that's what the Sabian Religious Order was in Chicago. And so I thought it was important to return to that history in my life, talk to all the people that I know from that organization, from that group, which is since disbanded the leader passed away and um and so that was that but nonetheless what motivated uh, everybody to to be a part of that group was very much aligned with what's motivated much many baby boomers um to be a part of many different uh new age and neo-pagan and christian um uh, evangelical groups, 
since there's this, this cultural wave, I thought it was important to contribute uh, what I have to contribute to academic work uh, regarding this, this mid 20th century wave that kind of rides um, that wave of counterculture and the hippies and, and the Beatles and all that in the United States. What's where, what's, what's the, the nature of that wave? So that's my contribution to that. You, uh, there, there's a, uh, a sentence in there that was about Americans becoming Santeros. Mm -hmm. And I'm just curious about what trends you're noticing as far as like, um, like how many people are, are like, you know, exploring these options spiritually in the country. Like, what are you noticing about some trends, uh, in the country for like conversion and exploration and stuff like that? There's a lot of practice in the United States, lots and lots and lots. Of course, you have many immigrants coming from Latin America. Um, and so you have those communities, but you also have these larger communities of people that oftentimes, yes, come from backgrounds where they're interested in Wicca or they're interested in um, Mason theory. They're interested in any sort of practice-based, esoteric, religious tradition that they can explore. Um, and so, yes, there are many American senteros these days. And of course, the use of the term sentero is also a bit um, not really loaded. Uh, in the Cuban community, it's a totally fluid, no big deal term. Uh, but of course, it's a reference to Santeria. And Santeria is a uh, a term that's pretty derogatory, even though that not everybody um, takes offense at it, but it is it is a, a derogatory term uh, versus Olorisha, which is, you know, somebody who has Orisha, somebody who's gone through um, the rituals in order to get those spiritual implements. That's a more, that's a term that I would use. Nonetheless, it's very popular in the United States. And uh, so I, I'm just one example of that. But there's other places where you can see part of it. What was uh, fun about this, about, about writing this piece? Like, what did you enjoy about the process of doing this research? It was nice to talk to people that I'd been at rituals with for so many years and, and ask them questions that, you know, you don't get to ask them when you're, you know, doing ritual work together because you're just kind of busy with it. Um, so, and it, and it was also really satisfying to see the parallels between people's life stories and um, what I was reading in the literature about religious shifts in the baby boom generation in the mid 20th century with the counterculture movement. So it's, it's, it's nice to be able to appreciate your place in, in history. Yeah, it's kind of like a documenting their their own life stories, too. You know what I mean? Like you putting down people's stories is kind of like, you know, putting their wisdom out into the world as well to share and kind of documenting the things that they've picked up on their own journeys. It's really cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah I enjoyed it very much. What were the uh, methods like for the methodology? You mentioned the methodology right there in the abstract, and I'm wondering if you had any specific, um, you know, thoughts and ideas that you wanted to share about how you go about doing the work. Yeah, it's um, you know, it's it's funny when I started studying anthropology, they just kind of gave you a, a pencil and a notebook and told you to go out and do field work, and you had you had no idea what to do. Yeah, they just wanted you to stumble through, I guess. But uh, when I decided to go back to graduate school, it was wonderful. We had classes in it. It was, <laughs> it was great. It was a sea change. Uh, but my methods are your classic cultural anthropology methods, participant observation and interviewing. And of course you have formal interviews and informal interviews and um, structured and semi-structured interviews. I think what is, what is most critical in my experience, I, I mean, when you're doing research, obviously you want to be comparing apples to apples. So it's important to make sure that when you interview somebody, you have either que that your questions align. But it's also important to not have a, a not decide ahead of time what you expect their answer to be. The whole point of research is to discover, right? So you know, what I mean, make sure that 
things are open ended enough that people can go in any direction they like. And that's when you really, that's when it's, it's exciting and you're learning things because you let people talk. And what I do more than anything is listen. Mm -hmm. That's my job more than anything is to listen. That's my job. What we're doing right now. I just like love having people. uh, I I totally understand because I'm, I feel like I'm doing almost like that exact same thing with the podcast. Um, Okay. So let's talk about some public scholarship stuff for a few minutes. You're part of the Sacred Rights Program, funded by Luce Foundation for a project called Public Scholarship on Race, Justice, and Religion. And I'm wondering your thoughts on like why it's important to be a part of the public conversation, be a public-facing scholar. Tell me a little bit about your own journey with that. Well, um, as as uh, as the Religion 101 <laughs> podcast goes, right? Religion. Yeah. Religion, you might be done with religion, but religion's not done with you. It informs so much of of what is going on in our society, whether we like it or not. Um, as a cultural anthropologist, you know, my my position on what religion is is sort of under the umbrella of culture. I don't I don't see it as separate from culture at all. I see it as embedded in it. But that being able to think about its effect on the wider society is really important, especially when as a society, we're grappling with this problem, that problem, the other problem. If we don't seek to understand the ways in which that problem came about or the ways in which, um, you know, society influences, you know, X, Y, Z problem, then we're not going to get too far in solving our problem. So. Mm. What do you think are some of the uh, like the risks and the rewards and responsibilities for you do it personally doing public scholarship? Like, is there anything you're nervous about? Is there anything that you're like really hoping for to like get out of it? Yeah, um, boy, I think when you put yourself out there, it's always uh, it's always a risk, right? Um, because words count. You know, mm-hmm. what, what we say count, what we say counts, especially when it is, um, what we say counts when it's on a podcast and, <laughs> and people can see it. Um, and when we write it and people can read it. So it, it really does matter what we put out in the world. Um, and certainly there, there are, I, I hear some academics argue, of course, always against being political and against um, considering uh, the political implications of their work in any way. And I respect that position. Political positions are always quite, you have to be extremely careful where that's concerned. But I think that the idea that you can be apolitical is sort of the idea that you can have nothing to do with power, but we're all subject to power. And when we teach about political, the political sphere of culture in, in a base in cultural anthropology class, when I teach about politics, it goes from the household to the government. It's about managing power and the distribution of power. So I don't think it can be escaped at, mm. at all. Gotcha. What are some of your, you know, public and academic scholarship goals in the next, uh, you know, three, four, five years? I, I, I want to participate more in the important conversations going on in the society. And of course, being coming, studying and coming from a religion that is very much stigmatized in the United States and, and throughout the Americas. Uh, but I think it's important to be a steady voice out there that people can refer to when uh, faced with these, when faced with stigma. I actually, the first time I taught, the first time I taught a uh, class in gender, I asked the students, what I always ask students, which is uh, what, you know, what do you, why are you here? You know, why are you here? Why do you want to take this class? And one of the things that the students told me, that a few students told me that I thought was 
great and 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 practical and I, I remember years later is that they wanted to know how to respond when they were in a situation where they felt that that they were being degraded for being female for being non-binary for being queer for being whatever they or or those communities that they were allied with were being degraded they wanted to have an articulate response uh, to the things that people said that they felt were wrong. So I, that's, that's part of my goal in public scholarship is not simply as to give words to what is, um, to why people in the world matter who are maligned in the mainstream. Well, Dr. Eugenia Rainey, um, I have loved chatting with you and learning about your work and learning about, um, you know, new traditions that I've never featured on the podcast before. So that's really, really cool. Um, thank you so much for being here. It's just been such a wonderful conversation. Thank you. Thanks for having me.